Everyone who fell into this hole disappeared without a trace. In 1938, a farmer from southeastern Australia made an unexpected discovery while leading his horses to a watering hole across his vast property. As they traversed the open field, one of the horses suddenly stumbled and fell. Surprisingly, it quickly regained its footing, leaving the farmer bewildered. Upon closer inspection, he noticed a small hole beneath where the horse had fallen. Intrigued, he investigated further and found it to be about a foot wide but remarkably deep. Curiosity peaked and the farmer got down on his hands and knees for a better look. To his amazement, he discovered a large pool of clear water some 10 to 15 feet below the surface. It turned out the horse had inadvertently stepped into the roof of an underground cave. Eager to explore further, the farmer returned to his stable, gathered his horses, and returned with a long measuring rope. With the weight attached to the end, he lowered it into the hole and began to measure its depth. The rope kept going down, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, until it finally hit solid ground at 120 feet. Astonished by the size of the cave, the farmer pulled up the rope, believing he had reached the bottom. Little did he know, the cave extended nearly another 300 feet below. This is the story of Australia's most infamous hole known as the Shaft, which has claimed the lives of 16 individuals. Whoever fell into this hole disappeared without a trace. The population distribution across South Australia paints a fascinating picture. Adelaide stands out as the largest urban hub, home to just over a million people. In contrast, Mount Gambier, the next in line, is much smaller, with a population of only 33,000. This notable gap highlights the stark difference between the state's largest and second largest cities. Adelaide's population dwarfs that of Mount Gambier by over 40 times, emphasizing the significant concentration of people within the capital city. While Mount Gambier holds the title of the state's second largest city, its relatively small population categorizes it as a small city. Nonetheless, Mount Gambier holds importance as the primary settlement in the Limestone Coast region. Nestled on the border between South Australia and Victoria, just north of the southern coast, Mount Gambier boasts a unique geographical position. Perched atop a dormant volcano, also known as Mount Gambier, the city and its surroundings feature distinctive volcanic landscapes, including limestone formations, crystal clear lakes, caves, and sinkholes, adding to its charm. Beyond the city limits, expansive farmland stretches outwards, reaching all the way to the southern shores. Amidst this landscape lies Thompson's Paddock, a tiny five-acre plot of land sandwiched between Mount Gambier and the ocean, holding a fascinating secret. In 1938, as a farmer tended to his daily chores on Thompson's Paddock, something out of the ordinary caught his attention. While guiding his horses and equipment through the field, one of the horses tripped over an unseen obstacle lurking in the grass. Curious, the farmer brought his horses to a stop and got off to investigate. To his surprise, he stumbled upon a small hole, barely a foot wide, hidden amidst the terrain. Intrigued, he knelt down for a closer look and was amazed to find that the hole stretched down for what seemed like at least 20 feet, revealing a pool of water at the bottom. The initial discovery, both surprising and unsettling, only scratched the surface of what lay ahead. The length and time the farmer owned the field and why he hadn't noticed the hole remains unclear sparking speculation about whether the horse caused the collapse or if the hole existed prior unnoticed by the farmer. The uncertainty raises a crucial question. If the horse did trigger the opening, does it suggest a risk of further collapse endangering the surrounding area? Adding to the worry, the visible part of the narrow opening extended only two or three feet from the surface, with the sides beyond view. Its shape resembled that of an upside-down funnel, hinting at widening below. In a dire scenario, imagine someone accidentally stepping into the opening while crossing the field. Plunging 20 feet into the water below, the design of the upper section would make escape impossible. Their only option would be to tread water, calling for help in desperation. The farmer stumbled upon an unexpected hole in the ground, sparking concern. Determined to tackle the issue, he opted to fill it with rocks to make it safer. Day after day, he diligently gathered rocks, each about the size of a soccer ball, and tossed them into the gaping hole. Despite his efforts, every rock caused a loud splash and disappeared into the dark water below, seemingly swallowed by the abyss. As he continued to fill the hole, 
adding dozens, then hundreds, and eventually thousands of rocks, none could be seen in the water anymore. It was as if the pit had no end in sight. Ultimately, the farmer resigned himself to being cautious around the opening, hoping that it wouldn't collapse further. Word of this peculiar phenomenon spread quickly, drawing curious individuals eager to explore the enigmatic hole. The formation was eventually identified as a limestone sinkhole, where water slowly dissolved the underlying rocks, resulting in a sizable opening just beneath the surface. Over time, the initial foot-wide hole was expanded to approximately 3 feet or 1 meter in width, facilitating easier exploration. In the mid-60s, a diver descended into the cave opening for the first time. Lowered from the surface, he descended 23 feet or 7 meters before landing on the water surface, discovering what resembled more of a small lake than a mere opening. Directly beneath the entrance, the space was narrow, but as one reached the water surface, the room expanded to a width of 56 feet or 17 meters. Moreover, during sunny days around noon, sunlight penetrated directly through the opening, casting a sapphire blue beam of light that illuminated the surroundings, earning the cave the moniker, the shaft, due to this distinctive shaft of light. Beginning from the water surface, the diver proceeded to scuba dive deeper into the cave, finding that its expanse continued to widen the further down he ventured. During his initial exploration, he descended approximately 69 feet or 21 meters before opting to resurface. However, the most astonishing aspect was what he witnessed at that depth, a multitude of rocks dumped into the cave years prior. From his vantage point, those countless rocks resembled a mere anthill at the bottom of a vast chamber, still positioned around 50 feet away from his stopping point. Subsequently, the cave was meticulously mapped, revealing a colossal central chamber housing the rock pile, along with two remarkably deep arms extending in almost opposite directions. The primary chamber spans 460 feet in length and 260 feet in width at its broadest point, with the summit of the rock formation lying 118 feet or 36 meters beneath the surface. Furthermore, branching off from the main chamber is a tunnel leading northwest to a depth of 260 feet or 80 meters. Conversely, on the opposite side, another tunnel extends to a staggering depth of 407 feet or 124 meters. Speculation suggests that these tunnels may extend all the way to the southern shores as part of an intricate freshwater drainage system traversing the mountainous terrain in the vicinity. Each of these corridors harbors numerous cliffs, overhangs, and constraints, adding intriguing features to the descent. The combination of these elements, along with the pristine water and vast expanse to explore, renders it a paradise for cavers. Notably, it wasn't until 1984 that an accurate map was finally created. However, as early as 1973, the shaft had already witnessed 8,000 dives. Despite the considerable number of dives, the cave's full depth remains unknown, and the comprehensive map has yet to be crafted. Essentially, it was perceived as boundless. The novelty of cave diving and the limitations of available equipment meant that cavers would reach the edge of the mapped area and peer into the abyss, pondering the cave's true depth. In May 1973, a team of nine divers embarked on what they believe could be a record-setting dive in the shaft. On May 26th, they congregated in Mount Gambier, establishing their camp near the renowned Blue Crater Lake. Their objective was to reach the perimeter, situated at a depth of 250 feet, commonly referred to as the edge where the light penetrates from above. Beyond this point, as the angle of the ceiling increases, the light becomes obstructed, plunging the water into near-complete darkness. Coincidentally, this location coincided with an area known as the drop-off, marking the point in the cave where the bottom ceases to be visible from the surface. This characteristic contributed to the shaft's reputation for seemingly bottomless pits, as peering over the ledge reveals nothing below, yet it evidently extends much further. All nine divers participating in this endeavor were experienced dive instructors. However, given the ambitious nature of their goal, they decided to conduct a practice dive and set up equipment beforehand. Consequently, on the following day, the 27th, they arrived at the farmhouse on Thompson's paddock, registered their presence in the guest book, and proceeded to the grassy field housing the cave entrance. They arrived at the opening and assembled the renowned tripod hoist system, a familiar sight to many. 
This hoist served the purpose of lowering the divers into the water below. Despite widening the hole, it remained too narrow for the divers to descend while wearing their equipment, necessitating separate lowering. On the ascent, the wire ladder was installed for the divers to climb out. Once in the water, they were astounded by the spaciousness of the room at the surface. Their next task was setting up a shot line, essential for their planned activity that day. This weighted line extended from the surface directly down to the rock pile, facilitating a smoother descent for their record attempt and allowing them more time to reach the edge. During the practice dive, they reached a depth of approximately 200 feet, or 61 meters, circling the perimeter of the rock pile and remaining well within the reach of the opening's light. However, even at that depth, they caught sight of the famous edge in the distance, their ultimate destination. The cave's bottom extended horizontally before abruptly disappearing. Following the practice dive and familiarizing themselves with the cave's layout, they returned to Mount Gambier to replace some battery packs for their lights and refill all air cylinders. The following day, on the 28th, they were back at the opening at noon, fully geared up and ready to be lowered in once again. One of the divers, Joan, opted out of diving that day, reducing the team from 9 to 8. Instead, she remained above to assist with supplies and prepare meals for the others. The diving team for that day comprised Robert, John, Peter, Gordon, Larry, and three siblings, Glenn, Stephen, and Christine. The group descended to the rock pile at 130 feet and proceeded towards the tunnel containing the ledge. Around 180 feet, Robert began experiencing significant effects of nitrogen narcosis, a condition resulting from nitrogen dissolving in the blood, causing impaired judgment akin to drunkenness. Although this occurred earlier than usual for him, it prompted him to ascend slightly to alleviate the sensation. It's worth noting that at the time, diving and cave diving protocols were not as established as they are today. Many participants, despite being instructors, lacked experience beyond open water dives in clear, well-lit conditions. Another was the absence of cave certification requirements. Individuals could freely embark on dives with minimal oversight, leading to potentially hazardous situations. Moreover, safety protocols at the time differed significantly from contemporary standards. In one instance, a group of divers planned a dive to the depth of 200 feet using regular air, a practice deemed extremely risky by today's standards. Beyond a depth of 130, the onset of nitrogen narcosis poses a threat to judgment and motor function. Additionally, at approximately 185 feet, the air becomes toxic, potentially causing convulsive seizures. Despite these dangers, eight divers were already submerged at a depth of 180 feet using regular air. Amidst this perilous situation, Robert signaled his intention to return to the rock pile, while the others indicated their intention to continue diving. As Robert circled the rock pile, searching for animal bones submerged in the area, he noticed Glenn's torch approaching. However, by this time, both Robert and Glenn were running low on air. The two individuals caught up with each other and resurfaced simultaneously. Larry also surfaced around the same time, followed by Peter 30 seconds later, who had nearly depleted his air supply. Peter mentioned that he hadn't encountered any other divers during this dive. A sudden realization dawned on everyone, particularly Glenn, whose siblings remained submerged with minimal air left. Moments earlier, the group had diverged from Robert and continued swimming and taking photographs until they reached a depth of approximately 200 feet. Glenn and his companions navigated along the ledge of the seabed, with Glenn spotting his sister nearby. At that moment, everything appeared normal, with the bright light above and roughly five minutes elapsed since the dive began. Feeling somewhat disoriented from narcosis, Glenn decided he had ventured far enough. Upon checking his gauges, he noted his dwindling air supply, realizing that everyone else would soon face the same predicament. To err on the side of caution, he opted to ascend, but before doing so, he aimed to signal his sister, Christine, indicating that she should likely follow suit. Approaching her to tap on her shoulder, he found her already kicking her fins away from him, eventually out of his reach. Realizing he didn't want to linger any longer below, he presumed the others would soon follow his lead and began his ascent towards the surface. Upon reaching Robert, they both ascended together. Around this juncture, 
Chaos erupted in the cave, compounded by various factors resulting in what could be deemed one of the deadliest cave diving incidents in history. Just before Glenn initiated his ascent, Peter, also feeling the effects of narcosis, desired to verify Glenn's depth gauge. Swimming toward him, Peter found Glenn already ascending before he could check the gauge. Peter paused, taking a moment to survey the crystal clear water below before noticing two fellow divers making their way toward the exit. Glancing at his remaining air supply, he suddenly realized that time was running out. Turning toward what he believed to be the exit, he was met with almost total darkness as the cave had become enveloped in shadow, leaving him disoriented and unsure of which direction to go. Earlier that day, as the group ventured into the cave, clouds had rolled in, drastically reducing the amount of light filtering through the entrance. Peter began to swim aimlessly, desperately searching for the exit, but the once clear waters had become clouded with sediment, scattering the divers in all directions. Three of them found themselves clustered near the deepest part of the cave they had explored thus far. Leading the group was Christine, followed by Gordon, with Larry bringing up the rear. As Larry and Gordon checked their air gauges, they realized their supply was dangerously low. With a sense of urgency, they signaled their intent to ascend, but in their panic, they started swimming directly upward instead of following the curvature of the cave ceiling. In these limestone caves, natural formations sometimes cause sections of the ceiling to break away, forming dome-shaped depressions. It is believed that the gases expelled by the divers accumulated in one of these cavities, creating a reflective surface on the ceiling, resembling the area near the entrance. In their disoriented state, their flashlights reflected off this surface, leading them to believe they were swimming in the correct direction. Consequently, they ascended directly upward and collided with the ceiling above them. Amidst the panic, Gorn and Christine desperately waved their flashlights, searching for an exit. At that moment, Larry's light was extinguished. Temporarily dropping from the ceiling, his light miraculously ignited, illuminating another diver in the distance. He swam towards the diver, and from that vantage point, he spotted the genuine entrance further ahead. With determination, he surged towards the entrance, resurfacing around the same time as Glenn and Robert. Peter surfaced from the silt shortly after, finding himself among the group of four still-missing individuals, including his own brother and sister. Without hesitation, Glenn, upon realizing the dire situation, swiftly retrieved a spare tank and plunged back into the depths in a valiant attempt to locate them. Descending to the edge of the cliff at a depth of 225 feet, Glenn discovered his brother's flashlight and camera resting on the seabed. However, further exploration proved futile as the area beyond was engulfed in complete silt, reducing visibility to a near zero. Driven by the desperate desire to find his siblings, Glenn ventured into the murky cloud where visibility rapidly deteriorated, triggering a sense of panic within him. Realizing the futility of his efforts, he retreated to the surface only to find himself staring into the vast abyss, hoping against hope for any sign of their whereabouts. Despite Peter's subsequent descent following Glenn's return, their search yielded no results. With the arrival of an ambulance, the grim reality set in extinguishing any remaining hope of a miraculous rescue. Shortly thereafter, law enforcement authorities arrived on the scene and scheduled a body recovery operation for the subsequent day. On the designated day, police divers descended into the shaft, reaching a depth of 200 feet, only to encounter significant silt accumulation within the cave. Despite being at the limits of their capabilities, the divers were unable to locate any of the bodies during the initial search, or a subsequent one conducted the following day. Following the second unsuccessful attempt, law enforcement made the decision to suspend the operation until they could undergo additional training from the Navy, recognizing that the depth of the recovery posed unprecedented challenges beyond their current skill set. This process of acquiring enhanced training was estimated to take several months. In January of the ensuing year, prior to the recovery of the bodies, the landowners granted permission for a film crew producing a documentary on cave diving to enter the shaft for filming purposes. Having already captured footage of several other caves in the area, the crew sought to include the shaft in their documentary project. On the 22nd, they descended to a depth of approximately 50 feet, illuminating the cave with professional lighting equipment to create a bright, daylight-like environment. 
During setup, a technician observed what appeared to be a third person behind two teammates, prompting concern. Upon investigation, they discovered a body clad in a wetsuit. Alarmed, they ceased filming, surfaced, and alerted the authorities to the discovery. The following day, police retrieved the body, wedged under a narrow ledge just 50 feet underwater. Despite subsequent dives reaching depths of 180 feet, the others remained elusive. The recovered body was identified as Stephen, one of the siblings. By March that year, the landowners, uneasy with the lingering presence of three individuals in the cave, enlisted the aid of experienced divers with superior equipment. On March 9, 1974, a team of divers embarked on their own search mission and made a startling discovery. At the depth of 180 feet on the seabed, they found an individual lying on their back with another person directly beneath them. Descending another 20 feet, they encountered the final member of the group, John, wedged beneath a rock ledge. Due to the depth and the challenging position of the body, John's remains could not be retrieved until a month later in April. Nearly a year prior, on the tragic day in question, it is believed that Christine and Gordon had exhausted their air supply while sheltered in a dome-shaped pocket on the cave's ceiling. It has been speculated that they perished while holding each other, aware of their dwindling air and powerless to change their fate. This explains why their bodies were found in such close proximity. The exact sighting of John remains unclear, but one survivor recounted observing another diver swimming forcefully and deeper into the cave while the rest were ascending to the surface. It is believed that John was the individual who ventured the deepest into the cave. It is speculated that he may have experienced severe effects of nitrogen narcosis, leading him to navigate in the opposite direction. Conversely, very little is known about Stephen's final moments. He was discovered significantly higher than the others, adhered to the ceiling with his buoyancy device inflated. It is conceivable that, disoriented in the darkness or silt, he attempted to locate the exit by floating upward and traversing along the ceiling. He may have exhausted his air supply before reaching safety. However, given the absence of witnesses, the specifics of his demise remain uncertain. This incident stands as the most tragic in the history of cave diving, and in the years preceding it, multiple fatal accidents occurred in the nearby sinkholes within the Mount Gambier region. The shaft disaster served as a catalyst for the establishment of the Cave Divers Association of Australia, aimed at regulating the industry to prevent further calamities. Looking back, it's evident that the divers made a critical error by entering the cave without proper knowledge of cave diving techniques. Additionally, their decision to use regular air instead of specialized gas mixtures can be criticized, but at the time, such specialized mixes were not widely accessible. They should have employed guidelines to navigate unexplored sections of the cave to prevent becoming lost in the case of silted conditions or darkness. Interestingly, the divers were aware of the importance of guidelines, but opted against using them due to the large size of their group, fearing entanglement, which could have exacerbated the danger. Ideally, they should have conducted the dive with a smaller group, allowing for the use of guidelines. Fortunately, with the establishment of organizations like the CDAA, the incidence of cave diving fatalities has significantly decreased over time. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and stay tuned for more content.